sorry, mate. That's sorry, it was great, something. Great. Yeah. Something I was doing. Um, uh, doing okay. okay. Yeah, we uh we are we past our third week already. Uh, it will be further extended to the twenty eighth of April. So that's another yep. two weeks to go. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. How are you on your, on your side? Yeah, yeah, we're going good, mate. We're um um just uh obviously the gallery doors are shut, so that's hard. But we're um we're about three weeks into it now, and we uh, we've got a new website that's just launched. So oh, okay. you know we're uh, we're we're getting a few a few sales, so that's good. <laughs> Sounds like there's a a jet engine in the background. Yeah, uh, that's the washing machine. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my setup is in the dining area, which is very near to the kitchen, and also the yeah. um, the, the wash area. So it's yeah, everything yeah. inside. You know? <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I thought, oh, that's wow, you've got some really weird interference going on there, but uh, really? that sounds heaps better now. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it's just your washing machine. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I think the mic pickup is a bit too sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, is it better now? Uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, all right. I actually plugged the the other end of the receiver. I'm actually using this uh Sennheiser wireless mic. So um, okay, yeah. Just now I I, I plug it directly to the computer. Uh, now I switch yep. it to the FP, which is just about, right. about maybe a foot away. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good, mate. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm all ready to go. I got my coffee here, so um, right. You know, I've uh, tried to uh, make my um my you know, like I've moved my all my stuff to my office here at, at work. Oh wow! Okay. Because okay. um, because my sea container was a bit bit ordinary, so mm. you know I can get better light here, and you know it's just mm. a little bit nicer looking. So yeah, yeah. that's all so, good. So how are you coping right now? Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, we're coping all right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually enjoying the um, the, the slower pace. Okay. Uh, I quite like yeah. I like not having to um. Um, you know, get up and have to go to the gallery if I don't want to, because mm. because it's not open and there's there's no problems to worry about. The girls yeah. are all uh, at home doing their own thing, so okay. it's just Jen and I. And okay. um, yeah, so we're yeah yeah, it's it's, it's good. I'm enjoying it. Kids are yeah. annoying, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's normal. At least they get to see the dad more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're teenagers, so they they're not they're not too interested in seeing us, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, not so bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice so today, uh, I think what we're gonna do is uh, let's uh, discuss a bit from where we left off. Uh, I last met you about a month ago. Well, yep. a month already. Yeah. So fast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> today is the fourth. That's really quick. Thirteen. Yeah. Wow. How yeah, time yeah. flies. So yeah, we, we let let's talk a bit about the L mount system. Uh, I think yep. you have finally received your full Leica set. Yeah. Yes, so I have. Yep. Yep. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I'd like to maybe hear from you or maybe our... Uh, I'm doing a recording right now. So maybe um, okay. we, we would like to hear from you. I mean, how does it feel you know, using a full-frame camera? I'm, I believe this is not the first time you're using a full-frame camera. Uh, but you have since moved on to a medium format. And you have stayed there for quite many years, I think about uh, more than a decade. So yes. how does it feel like transitioning, you know, from uh, video format back to uh, full frame? Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's actually so refreshing and so, so good. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. I, I love yeah. my phase one. I mean, that, mm. was, um, that was the ultimate uh, image quality. That, and I've, I, I've, I've been using phase for, or had been using phase for about 12 years, I guess. Mm. Uh, but um, I was on the IQ 280, so I didn't have live view, and um, basically I had to rely on my eyes to judge mm. the focus. You know, sure. I, I mean, I can take a shot and, and and zoom in and have a look, but that was slow, and and the autofocus on the camera didn't work so great. So um, it was so nice to to get the the Leica system and go, okay, I've got a screen on the back that I can see. Okay, mm. I can zoom in, I can turn my lens, and I can focus critically on that, those important areas. Um, mm. I can touch the screen if I want to and just touch the areas I want to focus. And so um, I've been doing focus stacking. I've always done a lot of focus stacking in the past, obviously with phase uh, one. Okay. Always, always did. 
Um, so I'm kind of used to that technique. And, and so with this camera, I'm still doing some focus stacking, making sure mm -hmm. that uh, I'm getting the, the the right focus somewhere, yeah. and invariably, you know, invariably you hit the hyperfocal distance, and and everything's perfect anyway. But yeah, um, I, I still like uh, taking multiple shots. So I, um, you know, just the fact that I can touch the screen and point. I mean, this is probably this is stuff that everyone's been doing for for years. You know, anyone sure. that's got a, a half decent DSLR has has been able to do this sort of stuff. And mm. for me, it's been like. A decade of out, out in the wilderness and now i've finally come home to mm. to the you know to something that's easy and uh intuitive and um yeah it's good fun yeah um, i mean yeah i agree with you it's refreshing uh because you are probably experiencing something that you probably have kind of missed out for the past 12 years when you're using a, a different system and uh for the fact that the cameras today are maybe more more uh, smaller in size, more agile, more has more abilities, more functions as well. So you're probably able to leverage on some of the new features that's available on the camera. Yeah, see, my yeah. biggest problem now is that, um, I, I, I am not a very techie person. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want a camera to work. Um, I, I don't generally delve to, look, I hate saying that I do love techie things, mm. but I don't, with my cameras, I don't delve too deeply into the menus and, and find yeah. all these little things like when when we when we met when you came down to the gallery mm -hmm. uh, about a month ago and yeah. you showed me what is possible with the s1r i was just like oh how does he know all this stuff <laughs> this guy has just been he, he must sit there with a manual and just go through every single little feature i mean it's like and i'm, I'm just going now what did he show me and I'm, I'm looking at the s1r going oh man there's so many buttons and dials and so many menus <laughs> I have no, I don't even know where to start, but I mean, you've got obviously got that sort of brain that, that um, enjoys that sort of, um, um, you know, learning. But I, for me, I, I've always been wanting to get just the bare, bare basics. So with, with the phase yeah. one, it's been great because hmm. um, you know, shutter speed, aperture and ISO, that's all I really cared about. And, yeah. and well, with the phase one, with the IQ 280, I, ISO, I wouldn't want to go above 200 because, you know, you get too much noise. So yeah. That was easy. It was either um, 35, 50, 100 or 200 ISO and, and the rest was just shutter speed and aperture. And then my apertures were generally around the, the, you know, the F8 to F11 mark and, mm. um, and shutter speed from there. So very basic photography. You know, there was none, you know, focus stacking was all looking through the lens, looking at the, the ground in front yeah. of me, focusing yeah. at my feet then focusing and just manually doing it as I go. So yeah, really low, low fi sort of uh, <laughs> photographer I am. <laughs> you kind of remind me of a certain camera system that we use and uh, grow to light <laughs> that cannot yeah. uh, exceed a certain amount of ISO. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, the yes, the, 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 the Sigma, yeah. I know, and it's so funny because I had, I had, because I had my Sigma Quattro SDH um, yeah. and I love that camera. I still got that. I still love it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny, I had two cameras that could not go above, you know, a couple of hundred ISO and yeah. uh, everyone, everyone used to stir me. So, of course, I, I've done a lot of workshops around the world and mm. to places like Norway and Iceland, and I've done multiple trips uh, where we've got aurora and people are out there and they're taking photos of all this aurora going off and and I'm I'm sitting there with a phase one and a, and a sigma and I'm just going, wow. You know, <laughs> <laughs> can why? we go home now? Can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we go now? You know, I'm bored. And, I remember one particular time we were in ice. No, we were in Sweden. Uh, Sweden. It was about one thirty in the morning, and this aurora was going going crazy, and um, everyone was shooting away, and I'm shooting away, and I'm I'm sitting in the car. That's at that point it was yeah, like minus nine degrees or something like that. I'm sitting oh, in the wow. car trying to stay trying to stay warm, but they're all excited because they're getting these aurora shots, and and it just went on and on, and I I, I was sort of like stepping out i mean this was a There's workshop that i was do. running and i was stepping out going, yeah I was going, you guys had enough yet and it was like two o'clock in the morning i said come on i think you know i think you've got enough green slime in the sky it's time to let's go home and go to bed sort of thing you know and um yeah if i had a camera that probably could have photographed some of this stuff i would have yeah, yeah. were you yeah. tempted to to pull out your handphone <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well, what did I have then? I had an old iPhone at that stage, oh. I, and I did. I don't think it was going to help me at all. But um, mm. if I had the uh, the Huawei or the uh, the Samsung, which I got the new Samsung, uh, oh, okay, um, S twenty, um, it would have been alright for that night mode. But mm. yeah, but look, I'm 
I think the Auroras are um, they, they're, they're lovely, but you can you can only get so many different coloured patterns in the sky before it's yeah. all the same. Yeah, that's so true. That's I, true. I, also, I always say, the same. yeah, and look, I'm a, I'm a bit of a um, um, Milky Way sceptic in that uh, I think the Milky Way looks kind of the same most times that you shoot it. So all yeah. you really need to do is go out and get one good file of the Milky Way and then just drop that into everything else that you do. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> I mean, saying that, I'm just, know, uh, I, 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 I don't want to invite any bashing or whatever, <laughs> but uh, this is no, exactly no, no. how I thought as well, because it's the same, unless you are talking about uh, deep space, uh, you know, um, astrophotography, mm. that's a different Astro, story because yeah. you actually search out specific areas or maybe specific uh, uh, galaxies or planets that you're targeting. Then it's, it's probably a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, I love that sort of stuff. I, I, I love space, but um, yeah, I've, I've seen enough Milky Way shots to, to know they all kind of look the same. It's just what you put in front of it that makes a difference. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've had a, quite a few experiences with uh, star shots and looking at stars and taking people out shooting stars and and they're, they're asking me what um, you know what should I what settings should I use on my camera? I'm going, oh, well, I never actually really do this, so I wouldn't I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm no help to you. <laughs> but it's easy to do at, at Dunsborough, right? Because you don't have uh, much of uh, light pollution. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, we have mm. uh, yeah, pretty pretty good. Uh, Areas where we can go out out onto the Cape, where there's no houses, no mm. um, you know place like Sugarloaf Rock. So yeah, there'd be no light pollution at all because if you're looking out to the the west, it's it's a clear run through to Africa. So there's nothing in between. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's usually pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm loving the Leica, and, and of course, as you know, um, I've got the S1R uh, Lumix S1R uh, at the moment okay. as well. So mm. I've got the two cameras to. Uh, the, the, the S1 I was just to play with and mm. and um, and see how I like it, and I have to say I I, I'm, I struggle which one am I going to take out because I don't generally uh, take both because mm-hmm. I I don't want to get too confused with yeah you know things um, and of course they all work a little bit differently yeah. um, but um, yeah it's um, yeah it's a hard decision to make. <laughs> and I think I, I generally take the Leica because I paid for the damn thing. And, and it's like, okay, I paid a lot of money for this, you know, whereas okay. the S1R, is, I'm just loaning it. So, yeah. um, you know, I feel like kind of feel guilty if I'm not using the, the Leica. And, mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, the, I, I, look, I, I think that S1R is an amazing camera. And, mm. um, you know, you've talked a lot about the, um, the L-Mount Alliance. And yes. I, I can hear yes. your washing machine going off. I can hear your washing oh, yeah, machine going off again. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's spinning again. <laughs> Apologize for that. Well, that's it. I, well, have to, I have to confess that I never read the S one hour manual because it's just too right. thick. Yeah, it's so thick. Oh. Well, fortunately, oh. uh, most of the things are la- rather logical. Uh, if you dare to explore it, it, it really goes beyond like you know uh, what you would expect it to do. So uh, yeah. experimenting it is quite fun actually. Yeah, yeah. some of the advanced yeah, yeah. features like the post focus I showed you. Um, yep. And also the high resolution mode is easy because I, I use it very often. Mm. I I configured yep. it in, onto one of the buttons to trigger. Yeah. Oh, have you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's can. a good idea. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I, I I use that all the time as well, and that's that's part of the reason why I like yep. going out with the S one R is that high definition mode. And of course, the Leica will have it um, will in have their camera soon. soon. Yeah, very soon. Yeah, the, um, they were saying um, first quarter, but then the last thing I saw was going to be middle of the year. So, but we're not far away from the middle of the year, really. A couple of months, yeah, hopefully. That's true. That's true. Because it that's is. just, mm. yeah, it's just yeah. crazy. It's crazy that um, the high def mode. Yeah. I, I can't believe it. I can't believe um, <laughs> how, uh, how good it is. And especially when you think about if you're using the S1R, you're using a camera mm. system that with a lens you can get for around the $5,000 Aussie mark, mm. you know, mm. um, and it can do 187 megapixel captures Yeah, and, and they're good. And it's, um, uh, yeah, my biggest problem at the moment is that, um, I want to make all these massive prints, but our, our big printer is broken at the moment. We've got uh, oh. a problem with the head. Yeah. Ah. So, uh, okay. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, I'm looking at, um, you know, it's at the back there. You can just see it there. That's uh, that's yeah. it back there. Oh, hang on. 
that's the P ten thousand, right? Yeah. That's uh, the P that's P a, ten thousand. Uh, no, the twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Oh, got that, the, that big one. Okay. Yeah, and the other the ten thousands over that way. So oh, okay. yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're lucky enough to have both of them, which is quite nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I want to make some big prints. Um, mm. But you know, when we when when I was with you, we made that one print. Yeah. And that looks so good, even considering, I don't think we um, we shot it as good as we probably could have. Yes. Um, you also had and I think, yeah, and and I I think I shook, I might have shook a little bit, or I might not have focused properly yeah. or something. Yeah. And I thought, oh, well, this is the high def, because I remember seeing that file going, oh, if this is as good as the high def mode is, it's not that great. Because I thought, oh, it's, it's not really that sharp. And then we made the print and it still looked amazing. <laughs> but then I've, since, since I've, I've done it properly with, with a you know, tripod and all that sort of stuff. And here's one I did the other day. I was out because oh. I didn't know about um, the, I, I knew about the mode one and the mode two on the S1R. Yeah, and, one and mode two. But I hadn't. I didn't realize which was which. I just was just using mode one. And then I was um, down there and I took a photo uh, of, the, of this boat. It's a little dinghy on the, on the, or the mm. sailing boat in the mm. water. And it was just, just bobbing along, just really slowly. The, the mask was just moving a bit at the top. Mm. So I took a shot with mode one and I zoomed in and had a look. I was like, oh, look, that's got all that. You can see the, the multiple shots. Yes, correct. So then I switched over to mode two and it was perfect. And I just went, <laughs> how does it do that that's yeah. a, that's not right there's something uh, there's something uh, uh, supernatural about that because it's like wow how does that yeah. align those images so that's well how, how does he know how to compensate right yeah that's yeah. amazing and, uh, yeah and that file was um, that was sharp and beautiful and if I made a printer that well it would easily uh, match anything I was doing with the phase one mm. you know yeah. in my mind um, and um you know, the dynamic range on those cameras is amazing as well. I was yep. shooting with a Leica a couple of days ago and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of used to bracketing my exposures and doing all that sort of stuff. Yep. And, um, but I shot this one particularly just to underexpose. I exposed to the sky. I was early morning. I was looking through some trees to the ocean yep. and um, the foreground was completely black. And I wanted to, uh, I thought, oh, I'll just see how much I can recover. On the, in the uh, Leica files and it was amazing how much came out and it was perfect and I looked in really close looking for any noise that I could any hint of noise and it was really still really smooth and, and beautiful and I thought wow okay yeah. Yeah. I've got to stop worrying about um, my exposure so much you know it's, it just goes <laughs> to show you know the technology how it's changed the sense of yeah, technology you talked about true. that and, mm. and I, I just haven't been keeping up with it for so long and now I'm, I'm you know in the 21st century with the rest of you guys it's awesome <laughs> photography don't change anyway <laughs> yeah that's right yeah, still that's got a point matter. at the right thing the same. your compositional skills is still as strong as ever so yeah. now you can actually leverage on technology to help you you know break some uh, barriers and so on yeah 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 that's right that's what i hope to do i just so, want to um, share a video hey. i'm actually having the uh, s1r with me right now so i know it's a bit dark but uh what you can probably do, okay, now probably this is a better lighting, right? You, you see two buttons on the front? These yep. are actually like uh, uh, any but, uh, soft keys that you can configure for any function. Now, the good thing about the S1R is that most of these buttons has got a configurable function. So when you turn on your S1R, you can actually hold on to this button for like two seconds and you mm -hmm. will see a menu pop up on your rear LCD. Uh, asking you whether you want to change the function of the button. So you don't have to like fiddle into a respective customized menu uh -huh. to configure that button for something else, which is like, man, mm -hmm. where's, that, where's that option? You know, I can't find it. But here, you can just yeah. hold that button for like two seconds and boop, it will yep. come out. So what I'll do is that uh, I always uh, configure this button for high resolution mode. Ah, great, and great idea. Is, yeah, and it's always fixed at uh, mode two. Anyway, uh, why, why should I use mode one? <laughs> no reason. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> yeah. just, just remove that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, is there any difference in the quality between the mode one and mode two? Do you know, is it, does it do uh, anything? If everything is static, then obviously I don't expect any, any, uh, any difference at all. But if mm. uh, you need to compensate for movement, then mode two comes in really handy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, right. I've shot something yeah. really fast, like uh, waterfalls, uh, sea waves crashing, you know, to uh, at, mm -hmm. uh, on the rocks and so on. And it's just phenomenal. I, I don't know how yeah. they do it. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, it is. It mm. is amazing. Game changing. And, and, and yeah, and of course, some of the other cameras have got um, 
that high definition mode now as well, yeah. haven't they? It's like mm. the, the the Sony. Yeah. Or um, yeah, I, I remember that uh, you telling me that 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 funny name that that you um talk about. Well, let, let's the... not talk about that. <laughs> 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 this is going on, you know, on on, on uh, Facebook later on. So no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, Sorry what, about what, that. I think what what we uh what we are uh more um concern is that some of these uh, features, while it is very useful in a certain condition, but how practical, how practical is it to use it on a daily basis, right? So uh, I've been mm -hmm. sharing also during my Elma Alliance uh, presentation last week, it's like uh, camera makers can actually come up with a lot of uh, very state-of-the-art features, but whether it translates into a value proposition that people can use on a daily basis, or it's just like, oh, you know, I can only use it when nothing moves, you know, I might as well shoot in the moon, mm -hmm. right? So things like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's amazing. Hey, um, how long has Panasonic been um, doing cameras and, and photography? Did, oh, they, cause... Uh, it's, been, it's, it's, it's been a very, very long time, actually. I think easily two decades. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They started with the small so... frame ones, the small ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just a little uh, compacts and stuff like that. Yeah. Because uh, you don't. Yeah. yeah because, um, you know, it's almost like. Maybe maybe because I've been out in the in the camera wilderness for so long, being with Phase One, that um, I just missed all this stuff that was happening. With uh, I mean, oh, Lumix have been around for quite a while. Haven't they? I mean, mm. I can remember uh, Ken, Ken Duncan is a uh, ambassador for for Panasonic. Yes. Um, yes. And he talked about it, the cameras back then, and there was I remember they going, oh yeah, they're supposed to be quite good quality, and then and then for some reason this um, only only in the last really few months that I started to hear about this S One R, and that was. Mm. Um, when I started to get, you know, my interest sort of picked up, I thought, wow, how does this? And then, of course, you had yours. You bought yours yeah. a while ago, and um, mm. and started seeing some of the results. And um, mm. yeah, no, it's 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 good. It's really great. Yeah, even and, Panasonic um, started the first mirrorless camera in the Lumix G1, the micro ported version. That was twelve years ago. Oh, is that right? In interchangeable oh. lens, uh, mirrorless camera. They're the first who came out. Uh, even before Olympus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, fantastic. That's amazing. And I, I think what we are happy about is the image quality. How clean the images are, and I, uh, I, I think they chose the right sensor for this camera, for this this yeah. range of cameras, including the Sigma FP. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I half suspect that they probably source from the same manufacturer. And the good thing yeah. about the sensor is that, uh, good and bad actually, depends, uh, is that it doesn't have PDF points on the sensor itself. So um, the plus point is that you get a very clean signal uh, without all the uh, anomalies of having an extra dot on the sensor at each pixel location. Uh, otherwise, well, you just have to compromise a little bit on the speed of uh, acquiring focus especially in tracking mode yeah 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 right that's the downside yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah well, i'm so used to um winging my focus anyway it's been <laughs> so it, it, everything seems fast to me now it's beautiful yeah. <laughs> True. life on the fast lane now <laughs> yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah Leica, exactly. Leica has got this the uh, dfd mode uh, which they call that the EPTH depth from the focus. So they are trying to predict um, the, where the lenses should be turning towards based on the defocus information and from the depth uh, map of um, the, how they, they track sensor. So I, I think uh, this technology will only uh, go forward uh, in a big way with the advancements in the software and the firmware that they can put in without having to change the hardware. So if you have a PDF point, then you, you just rely on the hardware, which is fine. But on software mm -hmm. front, it's like how we see on our mobile phones, right? It, it gets so advanced that uh, uh, imagine we, we can't even do uh, or even match um, sometimes. Uh, you can't even match the kind of uh, exposure, the HDR of what the handphone can give us compared to our conventional cameras. So mm -hmm. it's all about the yeah. software. So I, I think that if they can improve further on the software and the algorithms of acquiring focus, it's just going to get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, I, I, where do you think it's going to go? Where do you think, you know, what, what's cameras going to be like in 10 years' time? Have you got any predictions on that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not too sure, but uh, I, I think um, everything evolved around software. Uh, that's that much that the hardware can do. 
uh, we still need rely on the conventional way of designing a camera. Initially, you need to have a lens, you need to have a sensor which converts all you know, light energy to electrical signals and then make up the, the image in the image processor. This will not change in the next 10 years, but I think um, how lenses and sensors uh, combine and, and, and match with each other is going to take a revolutionary step maybe five years from now. Uh, mm. Panasonic, uh, I think, talked about some organic sensors back then. Uh, and Fuji has mm. also done some advancements in their, in their sensor technology. And of course, the leader Sony, right? When you have that kind of mass uh, scale and economics, you can put a bit more money into R&D. So I believe yeah. um, things are going to go a lot faster. It's going to go uh, somewhat better. But um, we have to look at it from a relative point of view, how this translates to professional use, right? Because today, we... Well, uh, I, I, like, I like to use this term. Um, we have already passed the point of sufficiency. Okay, We, we yeah. are way deep into the golden era of digital photography. There's nothing we can't do with our cameras. It's just limited by skills, by knowledge, by techniques. But all in all, uh, sensors today has uh, gotten to a point that, hey, you know, the, the more you go, the more we don't need it, right? Like, um, you, you talk about 62 megapixels, you talk about 150 megapixels. Yes, they exist and you can just buy it off the shelf, but do you really need to use it up to that extent? And it's so hard to use because when the sensor pitch size, what constitute one pixel, uh, is so small, then you're going to have um, an adverse effect on how you approach your photography. So if you're so used to shooting at F11, you know, and you, you need that kind of depth, then anything past f5.6 on sensors that uses such a small pixel pitch, it, it's going to go right into diffraction already. So then nothing is yeah. sharp. Then what's the point? Yeah. We are not going to shoot yeah. our landscape with f4, f2.8. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Not that it's wrong, yeah. but you just can't do it. And how many people like yourself would you know, want to do focus stacking? It's like, oh, it's such a pain. Yeah. I got to wait there for like how many you know, hours just to get everything stacked. <laughs> You know, and uh, that's yeah. so much of post-production work that you need to do after that. It's um, mm -hmm. yeah. When you say that you're not technical, actually you're very technical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, in that side of it, I am. Yeah, yeah. It's just the, <laughs> the camera operations and um, and that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm a little mm. bit bit backward on, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I I was uh, talking to someone a long time ago now, and they were talking about um, metal lenses like glassless. Lenses. Have you heard about those? It's like, uh, I think I, I saw I saw one of those uh, um, papers. Yeah, one mm. one of those like, research papers. They talk about it. That's yeah. That's um. And that's a quite a strange concept. Yeah. You know, thinking, wow, how is how does that all work? And um, you know, you don't have a bit of glass. It's it's metal, and um, and obviously some signal somehow goes through that and and yeah. gets recorded on the sensor. It's just but that's that's quite strange. A strange thought yeah. that you could eventually have a, and I guess because you've got glass and lenses, and there's always going to be some distortion. But these are supposed to be, the idea is to be distortion free. I think that's what the, the yes. whole idea was. Yes. Um, which would be pretty remarkable. But yeah, I, look, you know, I've always said, for me as a photographer that makes a living from jumping around on rocks looking for beautiful landscapes. Um, yeah. I, I want something that's high resolution, light, and and easy to use. So that's that's always mm. been. Um, so I think, yeah, the the Leica is, the SL two is is a light camera compared to what mm. I'm used to, mm. and I don't think it's too heavy to to use uh, every day and to carry around and, you know, um, so. For me now, the resolution is at a point where I can get pretty much anything I'd need to do to hang in my gallery. Because we make some big prints. You've been in there, you Definitely. know. Yeah. I mean, there's a print. There's a print behind me on the wall, um, yeah. which is three meters by three meters of a, a mountain there at, in Norway, mm. and um, that was shot on the phase, you know, eighty megapixels, but it blew up quite quite nicely. Yeah. So you know, almost approaching. And look, if and when the, the high definition mode gets on that Leica camera, you know, that's yeah. just going to be, that'll be it for me. I'll, Free answer. you know, and, <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I'll, I'll, I'll never have to go for 
for any more than that, really. But yep. we tend to, we tend to go, okay, well, it's like I thought that the phase one would be my last camera. And it, and it could have been because I can do yeah. everything I want. Yeah. I guess now it's making uh, your life easier by having a camera system that allows you to be more creative. Yeah. Um, the only thing I really would love to have on the Leica is a, is a fold-out screen, you know, the flippy screen like uh, the one I was got. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, no. Because oh. I was, um, I was um, photographing it down the beach yesterday with my wife and, I had the legs of the tripod spread right out. I had the S1R and I was doing some high def stuff mm. and I was getting down really low and I'm kind of looking and I'm trying to look at the screen and, I, and then I thought, hang on, this thing folds yeah, out. You can, you can so I flipped it up and I was like, oh, flip it out. <laughs> this is so good. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's okay so for the young guys. Like this, yeah? Really make a difference. Yeah. 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 So I'm hoping that maybe with the, with the SL3, if it comes out, they'll have a flippy screen on it because it's always mm. been a favorite. Uh, when Fuji, and I remember when Fuji came out with the with the little compacts and the little mirrorless cameras, and they had the flippy screens, I yeah. I just thought they were the best things ever. So yeah, I do like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's for me. For me, um, like you said, you know, we we don't we've got to a point where we've just about got everything we need. Yes. Yes. And most people, I mean, you love making prints. I love making prints. Yeah. But most people don't make prints. Most people. Mm will take their photos and they'll end up on their computer screens and they'll go on their Instagram page and they'll go on Facebook and, uh, or in a, you know, slideshow or whatever, or they might make a book, but most people don't make big prints. Yeah. Um, they, they don't even make a print maybe. No, no. Yeah. So, um, back in the old days, that's all we did. That's what I used to do. I, when I was shooting film, it was all about making prints. Otherwise you never got to see anything. So that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. so it's a shame that we've kind of lost a bit of that, but, um, mm. you know, but it's still, it's still the best thing to do. Making prints is just, just wonderful. Yeah. Just curious, Not, what was the largest format you have ever shot on film? On film? Oh, my, the, I was using the Fuji GX 617. So that was, yeah. um, six by 17 centimeter yeah. transparencies. Yeah. So that was the biggest. I never did five, four or, um, mm. eight by 10 or anything like that. Okay. That would have been nice, but, but yeah, yeah. the Fuji was good. Um, it was easy to use. Um, uh, I used to have an old Nikon 801S. It was okay. a, like a little semi-pro camera. That was the first camera I bought uh, when I decided that I was become, going to become a professional. I thought, well, I, I've got to get a camera system that um, you know I can do the work with. So I bought this thing because it was it was fifteen hundred dollars and it came with three lenses. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. Fifteen hundred dollars. What's a lot of money? It must mm-hmm. be good. And it was the worst. It was terrible. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> and, and within six months, I realized that I needed to go to medium format film. So I bought the Bronica, mm. but that okay. little, um, that little Nikon became my, my light meter for my Fuji because the Fuji camera, um, uh, my Fuji camera didn't have a, a light meter or anything in it. So it was all manual. So I had to get the information from somewhere. So I would just use my Nikon, point it up, get my light readings, transfer that to the, the Fuji camera. Okay. And the other things like, um, I, I used to use uh, um, polarizing filter a lot back in those days. So I, I couldn't, I could put the polarizing filter on the lens on the Fuji, mm. but I couldn't see what the effect was. Oh. So I would just have a polarizer on my Nikon and I'd turn it around until I got the right effect. I'd see where the little white notch was on the, yeah. on the filter and I'd transfer that white notch setting to uh, my Fuji and that's how I'd got my polarized yeah, water so and stuff cool. like that. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> that's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. It was a lot of work, you know, and that's what you did. And then, and then um, I was using 120 roll film. So I was getting four shots per roll. Yeah. So, and each time I pushed a button, it was cost me $5 in film and processing. And, and I was, this is going back when I was just um, a struggling, I was a struggling artist back then, you know, I had no money. So, <laughs> You know, if I went out and took four shots, that's 20 bucks. And that was a lot of money 30 years ago. Mm. Oh, yes, <laughs> you know? there, is, there is. Yeah. So, that, that, I <laughs> so, think that time really honed you on skills, techniques, you know, to ensure that uh, you got it right on, on capture. Yeah. Because you can't see anything, any result until you developed it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that right. Yeah, yeah, you had to be... Yeah, I, I, I spent so many, uh, so many sessions out there and not coming back and not taking a photo 
because it was really important that I could only push a button when I was really sure that it was going to be good because, yeah. uh, you know, so many times you get the films back and, and you go, oh, well, that was a waste of money. And um, I always, but I, but I, that's something you don't get anymore that you get you used to get. When I was shooting film, I'd, I'd send the transparencies off to a lab to get uh, processed and then I'd go to pick them up and I remember they would say, oh, do you want to open them up and have a look at them here in the studio? And I go, no, 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 that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just have a look at them later because I just mm. was so embarrassed about my work. I thought, I don't, I don't want anyone to see them. Yeah. And then I would go out and I'd sit in the car. I wouldn't even get home. I'd just I'd, you know, hold them up to the light and then I'd be excited or I'd be completely depressed at what I got. But that was, you know, that, that could have been um, even up to a month from when I took those shots to when I actually oh. saw them. Okay, okay. Because I was living in the country, so I'd have to get them developed when I went to Perth or I'd send them up, post them up and then wait for them to come back. Mm. Um, so, you know, I love that anticipation though. It's like every time you got a, a, some film back, it was like Christmas or your birthday because you're opening up the presents, you know. Okay, in for a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and now it's like you see on the back of your camera, you go, oh, that's great. Oh, look, that's perfect, beautiful, great. Got that one in the bag, okay. next. And there's no waiting, there's no anticipation, there's no excitement. It's just that's what digital's done a little bit. It's kind of killed the, mm. killed the excitement. Um, so it's different. I do yeah. miss that excitement that I used to get from, um, from film. I'm not yourself, going back there, though. Yeah. Do you see yourself using film again at some point, maybe just for fun, for nostalgic purposes? No, never. No way. <laughs> um, oh, look, I... And that, it might be cool to kind of go back and get a, a really good black and white dark room again because yeah. I enjoyed the, pro, the printing and, and processing. That that was good, um, but it was so toxic to me. It made me feel sick every time I went into the dark room. And, uh, yeah. But I did love agitating that print and just watching, you know, just pulling the tray up and down and the smell of the chemicals and just watching this print sort of wow. come alive yes. and then pull it out and put it in. And, and there was something magical about that. And, and the yeah. guy was doing some pretty good. I was doing. I, I thought I, my black and whites were pretty good back then because I was shooting medium format. Um, I had a, some good lenses on my enlarger, and and I was uh, doing dodging and burning. So I, I felt like I had a bit of a handle on that. And towards the end, I was getting. I, I even look back at some of those old prints that I've got and think, wow, that wasn't too bad. You know that mm. that that's really nice black and white. And um, because that's all I did for for years, probably. Six years, it was just all black and white. I was doing no colour stuff because I didn't develop colour. I only started doing colour when I was doing um, some, started doing commercial work and weddings and portraits and stuff like that. But, um, but look, going back to film, nah, I, I look at the stuff I was doing, even on the Fuji and um, far out, I, I had no idea, whereas I was just com a complete bunny when it came to... Um, using that camera, I didn't know about diffraction. I didn't know what that was all about. I, I would, I would set the camera on f f forty five just to get Whoa. the maximum depth of field. And yeah, I would shoot on it, and you know, every now and then I would shoot on f twenty two or something, and and go, oh, that looks a bit sharper. That's interesting. And but you know, the edges are kind of weird. Um, oh, it was it was horrific. I had no idea, mate. I was really. Um, it wasn't until digital came along and, um, well, scanning actually, because I started scanning my trainees with a Imacon flex type photo scanner. Yeah. Um, and that was good. But then I, I developed a real dislike for um, scanning because that was a horrible, slow process. And then, uh, you know, if, if the negatives of the transparencies weren't clean, they would, you, know, you get all these black dust spots in yes. the, in the, um, and they all had to be spotted out and that could take, and there could be thousands. I mean, we worry about a few little sensor spots now, but this was, <laughs> some of them were just so filthy. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah, I hated that. But, um, but digital so good. I mean, I, I look at what I'm doing now, the, the quality of the sharpness is just, it just blows all that other stuff away. Um, so yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it's all, uh, you know, and maybe in um, 10 years' time, we'll be going, oh, man, I can't believe we were using those Panasonics and those Leicas far out. You know, you know, I can't believe we were using those cameras, those big heavy things when we could just use our phone. 
<laughs> you know, heck, heck, it's my phone shut. You know, don't you think? I mean, that, that's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. In fact, one of the advancements that I hope to see uh, manufacturers putting in effort is to try to increase the uh, dynamic range of the sensor without having to rely solely on software to expand the dynamic range. So that's yep. one. Yep. Yeah. 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 Because right now, what the camera uh, is able to capture is still kind of uh, limited compared to what our eyes are really seeing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's hard to, you've got to explain that to people as well because mm. um, they don't understand um, why you can't, you know, take a certain photo. And, you know, if I'm just taking photos of friends, uh, like uh, in, a, in a setting, um, I'll say, okay, well, let's, it's hard to get you all in the shade or let's get you all in the sun. But, you know, if we half and half in and out, I mean, back in the old days, it was pretty hard. Yeah. It's easier now. But, you know, oh, the camera's not going to see that. You know, you're just going to be dark shapes in the, uh, you know, against this white, this light background. And oh, what do you mean? You know, but I can see you perfectly. You know, it's like oh yes, but you don't understand. The camera can't see like we can see. So yeah, yeah people don't understand that, but mm. we do because we're all photographers. <laughs> yes. So, well, yeah, as you know, I've been mucking around with uh, 4x5, uh, adapting to uh, various cameras, especially now the l mount based cameras. Uh, I've been playing around with um, the Sinar 4x5. So, yep. uh, to, to, to some great uh, results and satisfaction in terms of image quality. Now, what I actually found out is that uh, while some people were saying that large format lenses may, be, may not be up to the resolving uh, requirement of a modern day digital sensor, but it's really not the case, especially if you're doing things which are short to medium distance. Uh, in fact, I've tried some at uh, infinity to the lens and it turns yeah. out very, very well. Now, what is exciting yeah. is that it, how, how large format lenses renders images. It is not that kind of very edgy, hard contrast, high contrast, uh, kind of modern day <laughs> lens rendition. It, it gives you, it is neither soft either, but it resolved in a manner that is so pleasing. Um, the only word I can think of is that it looks very organic. It looks yeah, naturally, okay. naturally pleasing. It's just like how I would see with my own naked eye. And it's like the feeling yeah. of, ah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. That, that feeling. Uh, it's just yeah. very hard to, to explain it in words. Mm. But it's that kind of rendition that really uh, pull you into the image. Yeah, and it, it works and is that, well with uh, the cameras that we have, you know. Yeah, and it's hard to adapt those. You just buy an adapter for those lenses. Uh, yes, it depends on the kind of adaptation that you want to, how you want to fix it up. But I was using a full real base four by five, so it's kind of big and you know uh, heavy. But uh, uh, I I needed to either buy a bellow that has a customized mount to L mount, or uh, for now, there's, I think no one is doing that for L-mount at present moment, but um, mm. I actually adapted to Canon mount through the okay. Sigma MC21. So it works yeah. out pretty well as well. Yeah, so it's a custom yeah, bellow. Okay. Yeah, on the, on yeah. the one end, it fixed to the Sina uh, holder. Uh, the other end is, L, uh, is a EF mount. Yeah, right. Yeah, it works. Right, so you, yeah, okay. If you want and, a more elegant solution, um, okay, let's take this off the record. I mean, sure, no, Jen is not around, right? No, <laughs> yeah. okay. no she can't hear just, you, which is a good thing. Yeah, okay. Just Google, <laughs> uh, just money. go to Cambo, cambo.com. Yeah. Uh, look for Actus G, A C T U S dash G, Actus G. Um, it is a modular approach, it's actually a rig that mimics a real base 4x5. Oh. And it has a, a native L mount on the other end. And the bellow is magnetically held together. And the oh. whole rig is so light, it's only 1.2 kilograms. You can travel with it. Oh, anyway. is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What was hanging? What was that called again? Uh, what was uh, Cambo, C A M B O. Yep, got that. Actus, A what was the rig? Uh, Actus G. G for Act Germany. Act Actus, A C T U S. Actus G. Let's have a look. Oh no. <laughs> Here we go. Aha. Uh -huh. Small, right? So, yes. Um, it's very small. Is it the uh, Ultima? Oh, Actus B. Actus B or Actus G? G. Actus G. G. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, coming up with a whole the, lot of stuff. 
yeah, the lens mount uh, is interchangeable, and yep. the bellow is magnetically held together. So you can uh, get, you can try to get the uh, the lens mount for Leica L SL. Yep. And it will fit directly okay. onto your SL2. Yep. And on the lens side, uh, again, there's uh, freedom of choices. You can actually opt to get their Actus lenses, which I don't recommend. Uh, yeah. Or you can actually adapt some uh, micro, oh, no, sorry, medium format lenses. Yeah, right. You can oh, also wow. adapt, uh, you can also buy one with, uh, uh, that can accommodate the uh, Copal Zero and Copal One shutter. Yeah. So you can use uh, a large format lenses. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That looks cool. Yes. And oh, man. You're a bad. Nah. You're a bad. You're a bad man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's buy it together. <laughs> One, two, three, click. <laughs> How much is it? I think it's about. I think it's less than four thousand US for the whole thing. Uh, okay. All the adapters okay. and rails and uh, extended bellows and so on. Yeah, right. And lenses are taken separately, but you can just opt to get to look for some uh, large format lenses. The Schneiders, yeah. the Rodenstock, the, the Fujinons, or the, the Nikons. They are relatively yeah. uh, inexpensive on eBay. They are used, yeah. but if you buy yeah. those from um, Japan especially, uh, they spec it up very, very truthfully and uh, they will tell you exactly what's wrong with it, if there's anything. Even if there's a speck of dust, they'll say that, yeah, it's not perfect, you know, because there's one speck of dust there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, re I yeah. bought myself a Fujinon 150mm, which is like a standard lens to the 4x5. And yep. they, they say that it's excellent plus. It's not even like near mint. So I paid, uh, I think about, oh yeah, I, I paid about 300 over US for that lens. It's just almost yeah. next, next to nothing. Yeah. When it arrived, it came in the original box and it came its ori in its original casing. And the lens looks wow. like new and they call it excellent plus, not even near, near mint or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's amazing. Cool. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so I, I've done some uh, panoramic uh, work at Infinity with this uh, setup on my Cinar, and it works yep. so well because when you have tilt and shift, you know, it's so easy. It opens up um, uh, ways of how you know uh, architectural shots or even the uh, landscapes mm. can be done without distortion. Yeah. Even for portraiture work, it's very nice. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh well. Okay, just need another four thousand US, hey? Okay, that's <laughs> our dollars. You know how bad our dollar is it's at the bit, moment. Yeah, it's a bit less. Uh, is it? Maybe about three thousand plus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that still works out to about probably four and a half, five thousand Aussie. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've just I've I've just spent thirty k on um, on a um, Leica outfit, so that's going to be a <laughs> tough ask. <laughs> Mind you, I did raise the money to 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 buy it, so you know something went out, something went in, so that's good. Yeah, no worry, yeah, you, way... need, you need time, so do I. So uh, let, let's yeah. put in like $10, $10 a day, you know, we just save up. Right? <laughs> yeah. by, by end of the year, yeah. when Christmas is coming, yeah, we could yeah. make there you that go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can stop drinking coffee because I mean, I spend, you know, four or five bucks on coffee every day. That's, ah, okay. you know, it's getting there. It's mm -hmm. part of the way. Mm -hmm. It's halfway there already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. So you, you talk about your experience in dark room and uh, your short film and so on. How, how much of this knowledge are transferable to digital photography in your opinion? Um, well, I, it's, well, I guess the, you, a lot actually, because when I was in the dark room, it was always, um, I was always dodging and burning, you know, so, I was uh, using my hands or I was using little paddles that I created or I would cut out little bits of cardboard and try and um, just uh, highlight places uh, that I wanted to you know, lighten or darken. So that obviously a lot harder to do. So, But I was doing all that before I even, before digital was even a thing. Okay. You know, so, okay, this is how you've got to... So when uh, I transferred across to you know, digital imaging, um, it, it, was, it was quite... This is quite similar. My my early work was um, more about just getting the colours right and getting the contrast set up and stuff like that and mm. spotting. So, if you look at my early work, which is, is slowly getting weaned out, um, it was all very true, true to life. Maybe probably pushed a little bit hard on saturation because you know when you're starting out, you do yeah. tend to make things a little bit more glossy and pretty, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's fine because people still buy those images today in my yeah. galleries. We still 
I'm selling photos that I shot 15 years ago on film. Um, um, but um, yeah, there was definitely a, a crossover. So I understood um, light and how light should fall on, on a subject. And, and um, you know, by trying to make it look as real as possible, um, and, and, and it's actually easier, so much easier with digital, obviously, than, than in, um, you know, and it's, yeah, it, it definitely was um, a help to be doing that sort of thing already, you know, yeah. analog sort of way. Yeah. I agree with you because uh, when I started digital photography, uh, anyway, I never wanted to become a photographer. So somehow I got <laughs> uh, so, so uh, much involved in printmaking and started asking fundamental questions. And it leads me to uh, ways of acquiring images and how we look at post-processing. Um, in fact, today we see a lot of over-processed images from Facebook, from Instagram, from you know all these uh, so, um, photo sharing platforms. So, how much is enough, in your opinion? Or rather, maybe I break this question into two. Um, your images are obviously gorgeous. I've seen them in large prints in your gallery, and they are mesmerizing. So, from the acquisition right up to the final print, how much do you normally put in in terms of post processing, in terms of percentage? Yeah, look, I've been through phases, and in the I think what happens is when you start to get an idea of what Photoshop can do, mm. you like everything, you, you go a little bit hard, and you you'll 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 push the limits a little bit and go yeah. further than you, you think. And 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 I've sort of gone with fashion and and trends. So yeah, there was a there were, I went through a really dark phase, not personally, but in my images, they were everything was heavily processed, quite dark, quite moody, and um, so a lot of work went into those things, but I look back now and I go, wow, that's, it just looks dodgy. It doesn't, it's lost its um, realistic nature. And, and look, I'm a landscape photographer predominantly. I don't mm. um, consider myself an art photographer or a, um, someone that does conceptual work. My, my, my bread and butter and my, my whole career has been photographing beautiful places. So I've, I've found that, more recently, probably in the last uh, probably 10 years, I've gone back to creating more realistic looking images that aren't too processed. Mm. I still, there's still a lot of processing in them. So mm. um, for example, I would get a, an image and if it's something that I'm really, really want to, um, uh, I really love with, I'll, I'll do things um, like I'll put in a new sky. There's, there's, I don't uh, shy away from that. I, if if I've taken a photograph and the, and the subject's great, but mm. the sky is lacking, which happens quite a lot, I'll find a new sky somewhere and and fit that in mm. and make sure mm. that it's it's accurate and correct. Um, it's it, it, the classic example is, is a picture I've got on my website, which has just gone up actually. You know, yep. we have got a new website and I've got a new category called urban, and there's a picture in there of my uh, Walmart truck on an overpass in America. And, right. and and to this day, that's probably one of the proudest moments I have as a photographer is that, that photo, because when I look at that, it, it has everything for me. It has this depth that has these subdued tones, this contemporary feel that I really love. It's got the subject, which is um, pretty much um, perfect. In every way, I look at it and go, "This is a completely balanced, rounded image that that really just floats my boat." I, I spent a lot of time on that, but that was more about the little micro details. So, looking at signage, looking at foliage, looking at um, um, the relationships between light and dark on the pillars, um, yeah. uh, looking at trying to bring out that three Dness to the image and the depth. So, when you look at that image, it, it does have a lot of depth. It's, the composition is, it's got this road, basically to describe it would be um, uh, an overpass on an interstate. So I've come off the interstate, there's the interstate going straight across like this. Mm. And um, there's a road going under the interstate, which is oh. disappearing off into the distance. Okay. And on top of that, uh, on top of the overpass is uh, this truck, a Walmart truck. And uh, it was actually a little bit, 
forward of the center of the image and I used post-production just to pull it back a little bit because it, it was just not perfect. But it was amazing because I shot it with the mirror up. I was, fo I was focus taking this shot and the whole intention was to have this overpass but not have anything on it. It was just going to be the overpass and there was obviously a lot of traffic, so there's cars yep. and trucks going by. And as I was focus stacking, I, I was on the phase. I had the mirror locked up, so I couldn't see through the lens. Mm. But I was just holding the camera as steady as I could. I was all handheld. And I was handheld focusing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, yeah, it's all, and it all lined perfectly in Photoshop. It's great. So I, was, yeah, I would shoot, and I would just move the focusing ring a little bit, shoot, focus ring, lift it until it got to infinity. Mm. Uh, actually other way around and um, uh, as I was getting close to the last couple of shots I heard this truck coming I thought oh no this is going to stuff up my my smoke stack <laughs> and I couldn't see where it was because I was yeah. just looking through this I just had the camera up but I couldn't move the camera because I was hand holding I want to keep it as steady as I could wow. I knew Photoshop was going to was going to align everything for me so that's okay um, but it, as it, it it went through I took the shot and I thought oh I think I might've got that truck. I'm not sure. I'll just take another one anyway. And when I got back and to, to the computer and saw it, I saw it was a Walmart truck and it was on the top of the bridge wow. and it was like perfect. The colors of the, of the Walmart <laughs> signature was the same as the yellow on the road were quite, quite close. And I thought this, this is just, um, Brilliant. The, the, it, it's one of those decisive moments Correct. and it was, it was an accident. It was an accident. It wasn't meant to be. It was just, it just happened to be there. Well, albeit a little bit too forward, so I had to pull it back a bit. The mm -hmm. truck that is, and um, and that was that was it. And so I knew that this is this is a, an image that's gonna that it needs my attention and some time. So I spent quite a bit of time getting that right, and then I'd go back and re-edit it, um, yeah, over a period of weeks, mm -hmm. um, do some slight slight tweaking to it. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's yeah. So I, yeah, I do I, I do a fair bit of stuff, but I, these days it's more about trying to make it look more realistic or if not trying to give it a, a certain sort of stylish, a stylized look. So I, I'm, I'm into that kind of washed out um, nuclear fifties era Americana sort of style. You know, you know that look, it's, um, it's that real old um, bad architecture kind of lots of cyan washed out look that I, um, I'm really chasing at the moment. Mm -hmm. And and that mm -hmm. that Walmart truck sort of fit fitted that brief Everything. quite well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so from looking at your images, I other than your strong composition skills, I also see uh, the mastery of colors and color harmonies in almost all your images. Right, it's all very complementary, very suiting. It's like that's that you don't put colors which are which are opposing to be to be together. You know, it is not dominant. So it's always very pleasing to look at and it kind of draws one's uh, attention deep into it, you know. So is this something that you develop over time or is by training? Um, I think um, I always, it's hard to sort of say whether I, um, I've, I've just trained myself to see that way or whether it just, it's instinctive because I, I, I literally go out and I look through the viewfinder yeah. and I go, does that look pretty? Um, if it does, then I'll push the button. It, does that look pleasing to my eye? And, and yeah. colours definitely are. And, and I look at, you know, when I get images back on the computer, I look at the colour relationships and I will make adjustments to the colours to make them more harmonious. And to a point where for a while I was actually going into Photoshop using a hue saturation adjustment layer clicking the mm. colorize button and then coming up with a, a, a particular tone. Uh, it, was, it was about 40 uh, on the, on the hue slider. Um, it was kind of like a yellowy warm sort of tone. Yeah. So that would give the whole image just the same color tone. And then I would change the blend mode of that layer to, to hue. And then, then I would pull the, um, and then of course all the colors were quite the same. Mm. Um, and then I would pull the set the, the opacity slider back on, yeah. on that layer yeah. and just so reveal it and I'll keep going back. Yeah. Mm. And then all of a sudden those colors that were a bit jarring mm -hmm. then started to look closer. Uh, they looked like they, they fit together nicer. So I was doing a bit of that, mm. but, um, yeah, look, I, yeah, I definitely look at colors and go, 
that's not right. That 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 really just looks awful with that colour. You know, like they say, blue and green should never be seen. I, I don't think that actually is true because blue and green looks quite nice together. But yeah, I, I do. Maybe I, although my wife would say I don't have a I don't have a sense of colour coordination at all because I'll I'll come out with a pair of brown jeans and a blue shirt and she go, oh, that can't go together. What are you doing? You know, go put some black jeans on or you know. What are those? What are you wearing with brown shoes with that? Oh, you know. Oh. So, so I, like, I don't know. Like Maybe Christian, you are not a macro photographer. You don't look at things yeah. which are very near. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. So I look at my. I should look at myself in the mirror and go, "Would I? Uh, would I be comfortable going out in this? And, you know, out to that? And I, normally I go, "Yeah, this looks fine." You know. So, well, I'm coordinated today. I got black shoes, blue jeans, and blue mm-hmm. shirt. So that's yeah, that's pretty neutral. Safe. Yeah, it's very yeah, 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 yeah. color combination. Black is not yeah. a colour. <laughs> no, that's right. Exactly, it's not. Yeah, yeah. but um, oh, yeah, yeah, I think um, it's just I have probably it's probably a bit of both, a bit of training and a, a bit of natural sort of like, yes, mm. those colours look good. And and I'm looking out my window now, and I can see across the street, and I can see green trees, and then through there, there's a the, the side of a building, a house that's got like kind of browny orange weatherboard sort of on it, and you know, and then there's some blue in there and some greys and, and the sky is kind of a grey blue. And I'm looking at it all and it's going, okay, well, yeah, it's not too bad. There's, there, there is some issues there. So, you know, if I was to photograph that scene now, I would, I would, I would look at the colour of that, that orange or that, that browny kind of uh, colour and, and try and make that fit nicer, whether I'd increase the saturation or decrease it, um, whether the trees, I would change the, the, the green of those trees. So... Yeah. You know, you've got to be careful that you don't make it look too unrealistic. But, um, but you know, it's it's all my my whole mode of operation is: would I hang it on my wall? Mm. And if if I would hang it on my wall, then I would think my customers would probably feel the same way. And then that's that's the aim with my my photographs. So people go, "Oh, do you enhance the colours?" And I say, "Well, yes, I do." Because if I gave you the raw file, you probably wouldn't want to hang it on your wall either because yeah. it's, it's, it needs a, a, a little bit of a pop. Yeah, a visual so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's I, I, I sell decor photography. and that's, It has mm. to look nice on someone's wall. Yeah, just to go maybe deeper into your creative brain, right? so to tap into Christian <laughs> Fletcher's brain. So when you see a subject <laughs> of potential for photography, uh, is it drawn to you? I mean, does it, do you do you gauge on how you want to compose it more on the color perspective, on the lighting perspective, or on maybe things like shape, which are more dominant? Yeah, most of the time. Uh, I I think it's generally shape is the the first one I look at. Okay. Um, that that always seems to be the thing I'm looking at. I I, I go to the beach or let's you say yeah I'm doing a seascape. I'll look at the shapes. I'll look at the way the lines are uh, leading me in or not leading me in. I'll look at things yeah. that are just uh, a big block shape that's sort of blocking off you having any sense of depth. Um, so shape's definitely the first thing. Uh, that's not to say I don't look at colour as well because when I do my urban stuff, um, I do a lot of urban photography and that's all done from the car window. So I, I get in the car and I, I take my camera and I put it on my lap and I drive around these little towns and mm. um, and I can see I see all these compositions and and initially when I'm doing that I'm looking for color because I I'm looking for sides of buildings that might be a bright red or a yellow or a blue or something and so I'm looking for colors first and then I then think about the shape once I've got that that uh, that color that I like okay okay well that color's there. Now that's a red wall and just over to the left there, there's a yellow pole. I might put those two together because they look really mm. nice. Yeah. And then I start to think about how I can compose that, look at the shapes and then, um, so yeah, all those things are important, mm. you know, um, yeah. And light obviously. So, you know, those three things together. Yeah. But, so a lot of the time I photograph in fairly average light. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be middle of the day, uh, mid morning, mid afternoon, where there's some, some some harsh shadows, but yeah, I'm doing my processing now where I quite like that. Look, I like those harsh shadows, not because I'm going to leave them as harsh shadows, but because I will get, I want to have the, the sense that there is a harsh shadow, yeah. but I pull all that, I pull all that, 
the darkness out so that the shadow's there, but it's, it's, it's very pastel. The whole scene becomes light, yeah. um, you know, without blowing the highlights. He's just bringing that up and it, and it looks more cartoony, more illustrative. And I, I really like that look. So, yeah. so that I, I create a lot of the looks. If you go to my website and look at the urban category that I have, a lot of the stuff that's in there is done like that where it's shot in pretty average light, uh, but it's been um, edited in a way that it, it makes it look nice because it's nothing worse to me than a really, really dark shadow with nothing in it, unless that's what you're intending on doing. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I love to see detail and, and everything, but when you do that, you pull, once you start pulling that contrast out, the images become a more flat. It, it's yeah. a flatter look, and it and it looks like someone's painted it, not not photographed it. Yeah. It doesn't look because uh, that's one thing I I, I notice is um, someone will take a photograph of the same thing as I will, mm-hmm. but their 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 photo might look like a photo. I, I'll take that same shot, but I'll do something to it to make it look less like it was a photograph. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's going to be something a little bit different because okay, that photo looks like the same photo that that person took to that person to that person. They all have this um, sameness about them, and um, you know, try to try to make something a little bit different looking. I think it makes sense because it creates a style on your own how you interpret uh, a certain landscape. So you, mm. you you don't you don't your approach is never to try to take a faithful reproduction of the scene, but it's to interpret mm. it, you know, uh, maybe there's a deeper meaning to how you want to interpret it by accentuating or, or diminishing certain uh, elements within the scene to try to bring yeah. forth a, a, a new light, per se, a new light at looking at this image altogether. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, I don't always get it right. and uh, Not all my photos are great. I take a lot of them. A lot of them, no we one will see because those which are which you think are not great anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's right. Know. Yeah. Well, that was, oh. it's interesting. I I went to a uh, uh, a meeting with a guy from an advertising agency way back mm-hmm. when I first started out taking photographs, and he and he said, "Oh, can you bring some of your work down to show me?" And this was back in the days of uh, film, so I, I took him. Uh, I had these transparencies, and they were in these slide holders. They're they quite nice, and I had a light box. And he had a look through and I had some really good ones there, but I had some real bad ones as well. Yeah. And he said, Christian, he says, he says, my bit of advice is do not show, only show your best work. Don't show someone the work that's almost all right, big, almost good, because mm. they will judge you on your worst shots. They won't judge you on your best shots. Your best shot. yes. So, and that was, that was important uh, information that I got way back when. So if you can hold back and just show the best work, People had this this feel this this perception that you only take good photos, and the reality is completely different. Most people take a lot of dogs. They know? don't need to know. <laughs> no, they don't need to know. That's right. They need to think. Wow, this guy is. This guy just pulls out the camera and, and points it at anything, and it comes out a masterpiece. And, yeah. It's not a piece. And look, I look at every photographer and look at all their work, and you tend to go to their website and go to the very last page of their their photos. And you'll find all the ugly dogs that aren't good enough to be at the top of the page. So that's how that's how my new website works, by the way. All the best images are at the top, and as you get down to page number eight or nine or whatever, it's you don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no, what's that? True. Now, so, moving forward, yeah. uh, you have just launched a new website, right? So, what yes. about your teaching portal? Are you still doing anything on that? Oh, it's still ongoing. Uh, yeah, look, I, you know, as you know, I've, I've, I was doing um, a lot of workshops around the, around the world and mm-hmm. taking groups. And, and then a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, I, I started to question why I was doing it. Because I was, I was, even though I was getting to go to these amazing places and, and photograph and get shots myself, I just didn't enjoy the travel anymore. I was, okay. every time I got on a plane, I just couldn't. Now, I just didn't feel like I wanted to be there. And, uh, uh, okay. yeah, it was, yeah, it was, um, I don't know why, because I mean, I've done it for so long, but now it's to a point where I just dread getting on a plane and having to go somewhere. It's just some mm. sort of thing I've got in my head now that, 
And of course, the last couple of times I went away, uh, one time I was coming back from Cuba, I got sick. So I was on the plane, I felt awful, thought I was going to throw up the whole way. And, and I was sitting in the plane going, never again, never again. You know, why, why are you doing this? So I, I, thought, I decided that um, if I'm going to do stuff, it's got to be where I'm comfortable, in my backyard or in Australia or, or close to home. Yeah. So that there's no, none of this traveling for two days across the world to, to some exotic location, which is, yeah. is not what you, is not what you expect anyway, when you get there, because it's, you see these places. I remember when I um, first went to uh, America and I went to the Ni- Niagara Falls uh-huh. and I always had this vision of Niagara Falls of this, this beautiful place in the wilderness on the edge of some national park somewhere. And I got there and it was right, you know, on the edge of a suburb and, uh, you know, a, a kind of a city next to it on the Canadian side. And I'm going, what? This is not what I had yeah. thought Niagara Falls was all about. Mm-hmm. And another place in, uh, which gave me that same feeling was in Queensland. It was a place called Miller, Miller Miller Falls or something like that it's called. Okay. And you get there and there's a big car park set up at the falls and you just walk down and then there's this big concrete slab that they poured so you can stand there at the base of this falls and you can watch the water coming past. And, and it was just so, uh, it was so man-made and mm. just there was nothing natural about it. Mm. So I thought, um, you, know, you, you go on these trips overseas to all these places, that I've, you know, taking these tours and you see some beautiful things, but they're not what you expect. A lot mm. of stuff in Iceland, you know, there's, there, you see these things, you go, wow, that must be the most, most amazing wilderness. And it's not. But in Australia, in, in Western Australia in particular, we have that wilderness. So we can go to a, a gorge um, and the only way to get there is to fly in by helicopter. And mm-hmm. you are in a prehistoric landscape, which is yep. spectacular. Yep. And there's no one around. There's nothing for hundreds of miles. There's no roads. There's, yeah. It's just, Uncharted that's, that's yeah. yeah, that's what I love. So that's taken. A, that's a bit of a stretch away from the the training. But so with the yeah. So with the with the tours and training, I've sort of pulled right back. And now I'm. I obviously had my my training website, which I do online Photoshop tutorials. But I've always found been comfortable teaching Photoshop. That's been my thing. Uh, whereas I've got other friends that are really good. I mean, like yourself, you're, you're amazing with the technical stuff and you know color management like no one else and you know, all the things that you know, it's just this amazing knowledge. Whereas Photoshop is my happy place where even though I don't know all why, or I don't know why Photoshop works in yeah. certain ways. I don't, I know what blend modes will, will do, but I don't know why they do them. And I don't understand the, the mathematics behind it, yeah. but I can teach people how I use it. Yeah. And that's, that's what's relevant because even though, you could learn how to skin a cat so many different yeah. ways yes. with Google. Yeah. Um, you still, still won't learn how I do it. Yes. Um, that's true. So what gives me my style and my look. So mm. that's, mm. that's, that's my, the thing that I like to do is, um, is push people towards that training site because then I know that they can look at those videos at their own leisure. Um, mm. It's easy for me to, to make a couple and put them up every now and then and, um, you know, it's, it's not a way to make a good living because I don't, I'm not professional enough to, <laughs> to have the whole introduction video and to me there talking. It's all about most of them are pretty much get in, push this button, push that button, hurry up, let's get it done, boom, done, over and finished because a lot of the times these uh, training videos you get to, people tend to go on a bit too much, take too long to get to the point and you just don't want that. You want to you want to watch a tutorial and it says, push this button, push that button. And this is the result. And that's, I think the, that's where, where my training site's a bit better in that respect that it's, there's not too much beating around the bush. It's like, okay, this is what you do done. And then they can, people go off and do that themselves and on their own.